Well, ooh, well. <clears throat> I have to tell you that I am pumped. Look at the size of this crowd. Oh, I'm, I'm still a numbers person when it comes to church. My whole ministry of pastoring, I was constantly looking at numbers. Oh, I know some folks say, well, you know, it's not the numbers. But the way I see it, every number is a soul, is a person. So the more souls, the more numbers we have, the more num souls we have, right, the more people we can impact. When uh, Brother Billy approached me about uh, coming up with something for Wednesday nights, uh, I told him that I'd pray about it. This was in December, and he could pray about it more, and we'd get back together, and he never got back with me. So I said, I guess that's an answer to my prayer. Uh, but anyway, he, he did. He asked me about it eventually. And I said, well, I've just been waiting on you. And if that's what the church wants me to do, I'll be glad to do it for 10 weeks. We'll see what kind of response we get and go from there. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Brother Billy, if, if you'll get a head count each Wednesday night in the class, so we'll see how this thing hopefully is going to grow. And it can grow if you will pass the word to others. And um, if, you know, it's, it's just like inviting people to come to church. If you invite them and you're excited about what God's doing on Sunday mornings, uh, people will listen to you and they'll want to come and See what's happening firsthand. And I believe it's true about this class too, that we can grow. We've put out a lot of uh, advertisement. The Southern Tribune, which is a newspaper in Southwest Georgia, with the help of Brother Sam, they have, they agreed to give us a big write up in their paper last week about this class and have asked me to write an article every Thursday uh, to summarize what we covered in this class on the Wednesday night. So I was excited about that. And then uh, last Thursday, the uh, newspaper in Clayton, the Clayton Record, ran uh, about a third of a page article on this class. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that others will see those uh, advertisements and will want to come to Cross and see what God's doing at Cross. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for being here. Exodus chapter 20 is our text <clears throat> for the next 10 weeks. Family values. Have you ever noticed that whenever we have an election cycle, that family values take center stage, Republicans and Democrats both talk about family values. Uh, the, the problem is that so many people can talk about family values, but they don't have a clue what those values are. They don't know where they come from. They don't know how to initiate these values in their lives, and especially in the lives of their children. When... <clears throat> When I decided on this topic, I thought, well, you know, folks may think that 
I don't need to come to a class on family values because it's just me and my wife and our children are grown and we hardly ever see them and our grandchildren. So there's no need for us to go to that class. Or somebody may be thinking, well, I'm a single parent. I don't have time to do all that. And so I, you know, I thought about that quite a bit. I said, you know, we're just going to put it out there and see what God is going to do with it. And I, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that whether you're a grandparent or a new parent or not even a parent, that this, these family values can be integrated into your life to make your life what God wants it to be. Uh, William Bennett, years ago, he was one of our uh, politicians. Everybody knows the name. He said, it, it's not, it, or it is now, politically correct to believe in family values. But it's not politically correct to get specific about them. Now, that, that is certainly true. The Ten Commandments are the God-given values that every family should have, every godly family should have. You know the background, right, of the Ten Commandments, so I'm not going to take time to cover all of that in this class. But I will tell you this, that I've had people, you may have asked the question yourself, I've had people ask me, you know, are we still bound by the law of the Old Testament? And the answer to that is no. There are over 400 laws that were given to the Jewish people and including the Ten Commandments. And so they were very strict about trying to keep all of those laws. Can you imagine trying to keep all of those laws? And what we realize now is that those ceremonial laws that God gave to Israel were all foreshadows of Christ. They were types and shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ and were never intended to be perpetual forever and ever. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled the law. Now, does that mean that we don't have any need for the Ten Commandments anymore? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because the Ten Commandments are, are values. They're forever values that was given to Israel to start with that would enable them to properly relate to God and also to properly relate to their, um, their, their people. So those Ten Commandments have been passed down for generations and generations and generations. And so here they are for us tonight as our uh, bedrock for establishing and practicing family values in our home and in our churches. The uh, it's sort of a, well, it's laughable looking back, but it's kind of sad. Over the years, I, I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many people have, have told me well, well, Brother Don, I, I live by the Ten Commandments. Now, <clears throat> I'm talking about lost people primarily, but even a mixture of people who claim to be believers. And, uh, they, you know, maybe for a lost person, for example, I would probably be sharing the gospel with them telling them that Jesus is the only way to, to God, the only way to be saved. And somewhere in the course of that conversation, uh, it would be very common for a person to say, well, 
I just, uh, I just live by the Ten Commandments. Sounds pretty good, right? Until I asked them, I asked them, uh, tell me what those Ten Commandments are. Oh, well, um, let me see. Um, uh, uh, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Uh, um, uh, you know, I know I know them. I just can't think about them right now. And to many of those people, I've said, how can you say, that you live by the Ten Commandments when you don't even know what they are? It's a pretty good question, right? Well, you know, what we want to do here over the next 10 weeks is we're, we're going to see what those are and how we can apply them to our lives and establish good, strong, biblical Family values. We need that in our homes today. Now then, uh, let's start out in the first verse. And, and God spoke <clears throat> all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. All right, that's, that's our verse for tonight. It's actually one phrase, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. The first principle of establishing family values is to put God first. That's where it all has to start with you as an individual, with your family with your church. It's a matter of putting God first. Period. It's a foundational thing. And you know what? God demands that. God demands that God refuses to play second fiddle to anything or anybody. Now, what what does it what does it mean? To, uh, to say, well, the Lord said, verse 3, he said, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, now, what does that mean? Now, as, as we do these classes, I want us to be interactive. You talk to me, I'll talk to you. So you feel free and speak up, ask questions, answer questions. And that'll, that'll help us. I like that kind of a class. So the question is, what does it mean have no other gods before me? Okay, let, let me make it easy for you. What does a god do? Pardon me? Yes, he dominates your time. He dominates your life. Now, let me ask you this question. Oh, name, let's name some gods. TV. You mean there are people whose lives are dominated by a TV? Yeah, a few of them, yeah. What? Yeah, working your job can be, yeah, <clears throat> that can be your God. <clears throat> it dictates to you every move you make. Oh, what else? Money. money? Yes, indeed, money. Another big God. Family. family? Amen. Can family be your God? Yes, indeed, your family can be your God. Oh, your children can become your gods because a god is anything or anybody that dominates your life. 
Now you think about your own personal life and, and, and just think about what dominates your life until you, get, until you get this worked out where God is the only dominator of your life. Uh, you, you, you won't develop family values. You've got to have this to start with. You know, even good things, good things can become gods to us. Uh, recreation. Nothing wrong with recreation, but if, unless it dominates your life. So it's important that we build our families on the fact that God is God and he is our God and he will be the one who dominates us, who dominates our life. Now, here's a question. How do you do that? How can you do that? What, we, we know what it means to put God first, but what does it... Uh, well, let, let's just talk about some ways that we can put God first. And the first, first is this. In our finances. In our finances. Proverbs 3, verse 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, that's talking about our financial possessions, things that are worth something. Give back to God, and He will bless the rest. Do you know what the number one test of your priorities is? Your finances. That's the number one test. I, I used to tell people <clears throat> years ago uh, when I pastored in Miami and later in Mobile, uh, I had a ministry called the uh, Biblical Stewardship Institute. And I traveled around and when I could and did those institutes and things. I always used to tell people, I said, if you will... Let me look at your checkbook. I can tell you what's dominating you. I can tell you what your God is. And so that may be a good thing for us all to do occasionally. Let's take a look at our checkbook. Take a look at our debit card and, and see where our money's going. Money is the number one test of priorities. Do you realize that we spend a majority portion of our time thinking about money? You say, no, you know, I don't, I don't ever think about money. Yeah, you do. We're, we're thinking about how to, how to make it, how to preserve it, or how to spend it. it takes up a lot of time uh, a lot of our thought process regards money. The Bible teaches us from the Old Testament that giving a 10%, giving a tithe of our income teaches us to give back to God the first in all areas of our life. You see, those Old Testament Jews, you know, when, when they thought about tithing, they didn't think about just giving 10%. In fact, if you go back and read it, uh, all of them were required to give at least 23%. Now, what did Jesus say about that? You know, Jesus was adamant about it. And the New Testament is adamant about this principle that we ought to give out of a cheerful heart. Give out of a cheerful heart. Give out of a generous heart. Finances 
That's one way that you can put God first. You say, well, preacher, you know, this economy, man alive, gas is up to two, 254 in Troy. And probably going higher and everything's increasing at the grocery store. I just can't afford to give like I should. Well, the economy, whether good or bad, does not negate the command of the Bible that we're to give generously and we're to give cheerfully. My personal opinion is that that is between you and God how much you give. But whatever you give, you make sure that you give it generously and with a happy heart. All right. Okay. The next area, putting God first, is our interest. What what are some interests that we have? What are interests? Anybody got a hobby? Bees? Yours is bees, right? Okay. Anybody else got a hobby? Gardening? Gardening? You need to come to my house and practice your <laughs> practice your hobby. Oh. What? Cooking. Cooking. Amen. That's a good hobby to have. Anything else you can think of? Fish. Who? Fish. Fishing. Is it possible that any of those things, and all those things are good, right? Is it possible that they could dominate your life? Absolutely. Now here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Wow. That means if you're a stamp collector, you ought to be doing it for the glory of God. That's right. I do not like yard work. And I'm getting better at it. But uh, I, I tell you what sort of changed my mind about it because... You know, I just put it off, put it off, put it off. And every minute I did it, I hated it. And so I got to thinking back when I was a pastor. <clears throat> you know, people drive up and down Ray Avenue all the time. People that I know, people that I don't know, but they know me and Trish. And um, what are they going to say when they drive by this old Messed up yard. What if some of my people are driving around, showing a friend around, and they drive by my house and say, well, that's where our preacher, oh, never mind. Um, I wouldn't want that to happen. So what I started doing, and it worked for me, every time I know I got to do yard work, I say a prayer. I did it today. And I said, Lord, this is for you. I want you to be glorified in this activity, in this interest that I'm involved in. I want you to be glorified. I want it to be for my good and your glory. Now, I suggest that maybe you try doing that regarding your interests, no matter what they may be, whether it's golf or uh, working on your car, man alive. Just say, Lord, thank you that you gave me hands and arms and feet. And thank you for giving me some eyes and a good voice and things of that nature. Uh, do, do those things. But do them with an attitude of gratitude. And you'll be putting God first in those areas of your life. Now, the third one is relationships. 
relationships. If you're going to put God first, you're going to have to choose your friends carefully. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. <clears throat> As most of you know, Trish and I have three children, all grown and gone, married. Oh, we, we, when we were raising our children, both of us just drilled it into their head that you become like the people you spend the most time with. That's true, isn't it? You think about it. It's kind of scary in a way. Oh, now that Trish is retired, and I'm, kind of, I'm not retired, but I'm at home more than I used to be when I was a pastor. And um, so we spend a lot of time together. We're becoming just like one another. That's scary for her. She never wanted to be like me. But, <laughs> but anyway, the, the truth is that we, we need to make sure we teach our children this, that they be careful about the friends that they choose. That you, you as a parent, by the way, you ought to have some say so over who their friends are. Uh, there probably needs to be some times when you say to them, you can't be friends with that person and tell them why. Uh, I'll tell you a real quick story. I, my daughter is a school teacher in Pensacola. Her husband is a associate pastor at First Baptist Church there. But <clears throat> her husband was my minister to students when I pastored in uh, Troy. And of course, they weren't married up until, you know, later. But anyway, well, they did marry while he was still minister of music there. But anyway, uh, my daughter was in school at Troy University. And, you know, we had taught Mandy, honey, you know, you be careful who you become friends with. And um, I always told her, before you can date somebody, you got to bring them to our house. Let us meet him, see who he is. Let's get to know him. So, so all of a sudden, she brings this guy home from Argentina. From Argentina. Nothing wrong with Argentinians. And this guy played on the tennis team at uh, Troy University. Really fine looking young man. And uh, I, I, had asked, I asked Mandy, uh, before I ever met him, I said, honey, is he a Christian? Oh, yeah, Daddy, he's a Christian. Uh, where does he go to church in Troy? Well, I don't think he goes now. He's a Catholic. I said, ooh. So anyway, she brought him on to the house, and after he'd been there, I gave him plenty of time to kind of ease himself about 15 seconds. And then I asked him, I said, I said, tell me, where do you go to church? Where do you go to church here in Troy? And he said, well, I'm a Catholic, and uh, I don't really go while I'm in school. So anyway, they went on their date and then came back. And I told Mandy, I said, you won't be dating him any longer. I said, I doubt, number one, seriously, that he's saved. And number two, anybody you date is a potential mate, and you're not about to move to Argentina. I'll leave the rest of that story alone. She didn't marry him. But she did marry Jeremy, my minister to students. And, um, but we, we have to do that. Wouldn't you agree with that? Did you do your children like that? Those of you that are, you know, in my age group and you've got grown children now, we, we have to have some control over who their friends are. We're simply putting a value 
a family value into their life when we do that. All right, now then, uh, anybody got anything you want to say on that? Floor's open. Okay, let's talk about schedule. Put God first in your time. <clears throat> How do you do that? How do you do that? Somebody tell me, how do you control your schedule? Do you have a schedule? Huh? Not anymore. You, you and Barry I got beyond the schedule thing, right? Yeah, I know how that is. Amen. And I think it worked better for her when she found that that was too authentic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Tell, tell us how do you, do you, do you keep a schedule? How do you keep that schedule? It doesn't help you. Amen. You know, uh, things have changed so much since we uh, we now have become technologically savvy. Uh, back years ago, we all had daytimers, right? And we could outline our day, you know, everything we were going to do, when we were going to do it, who we were going to do it with. And uh, now... You know, we got cell phones or laptops or tablets or whatever. And, and what I find myself doing now, I used to do on paper like you did. And what I do, you know, you look at my calendar. It's, I mean, there's so much stuff on my calendar. But I put it there primarily because I have got too old to remember it all. And it's, it's just inconvenient to put it on paper anymore. So I try to keep up with it on here. And no matter how you do it, whether you do it on here or you do it on in some other way, uh, it's important that you that you put God first in your time. Now, what is the greatest way in the world to do that and the most simple? Everybody ought to have the answer. Spend some time with him. Start your day off. For me, that's the best way to do it. Um, if I wait until bedtime to do all my Bible reading and stuff and praying. Um, it just doesn't work. I, I, when, it's, when it's bedtime for me, it's go to sleep time. And uh, so anyway, for me, it's easy. I, I get up five o'clock or so in the morning. That's when I read my Bible, when I pray and so forth. That works for me. It may not work for you, but there needs to be a set aside time for God. And I think for most people, morning is the best time. What about some of you moms who still have children at home? Uh, how do you, do you have a schedule that you use? And how do you work God into your schedule and so on? Anybody want to share that with her? With us? Okay. Say again. We, we have school, so we do it in the morning. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, do do parents with young children at home do do they do like a devotional time anymore? I'm not condemning you if you don't. I'm really just asking this because I don't know what parents to do do today with that. You still have Family devotions? If so, when do you have those? Back when we were raising ours, 
you know, being the preacher, I had to have family devotions. And um, even though my kids were, uh, they were all four years apart. And uh, it didn't matter that one of them was four years old, but we're going to have that devotion for an hour. Can you imagine the misery that was? It was miserable. I, I don't think I ever got anything out of them. But I hope somehow it impressed on my kids that we need to put God, put God first in our schedule. We need to give God time each day. Okay. Uh, last of all, troubles. Troubles. Put God first in your troubles. When unexpected things happen in your life, unexpected pressure, crisis, to whom do you turn? I heard that old joke. You've probably heard it too. Oh, I can remember it. The deacons were having a meeting at the church. Uh, by the way, not your deacons. This is a joke, okay? This is a joke. But the deacons were having a meeting at church. And it was over the church finances. And they were trying to figure out how, what can we do to bring in more money? And they talked about this. And they talked about they could do this fundraiser and that fundraiser and so on and so forth. And none of it seemed to come together. And uh, finally... Uh, one of the deacons said, well, and he said, guys, he said, I guess we're just going to have to pray about it. And one of the deacons said, you mean it's come to that? <laughs> that, that, that that's, that's more truth than you realize in some cases. Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. Don't let God be your last resort. Make him your refuge from start to finish when troubles come in your life. Think about this. Worry is a warning light that God is not first in your life. At that particular moment. If God is not first in our finances. We worry. If God's not first. In our interests. Our relationships. Our schedule. Our troubles. If God's not first in those areas. We don't have a foundation. I mean you can forget about. Building family values. In your life. Or in your church. In your children's lives. And by the way. If you're a grandparent. Let's go a step further. And say that grandparents can help do this too. Right? Right? They really can, especially if your grandchildren live close to you. Uh, sometimes parents need to be reminded by their parents that uh, God needs to come first. You need your teacher of children that God comes first. So, <clears throat> what are your family values? If you're going to have any family values, you've got to start right here tonight with what we've talked about. Putting God first. Next week, uh, we're going to uh, be talking about family idols. Verses 3 through 6. Family idols. That's an interesting thing. So, between now and then, 
Why don't you give this thing some thought about what place does God play in your life? In these five areas in particular. By the way, those five areas I mentioned are an acronym for FIRST. Don't know if you noticed that or not, but that'll help you to remember them. In those areas of our life especially, let's put God first. You shall have no other gods before me. I am the Lord your God. Is he? I pray that he, that he is. Let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for these few moments you've given us to consider the very foundation of family values. Lord, we, we live in a society where few families, few families have biblical family values. Most of them do not know what it is. They don't know the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Lord, so, so many people who are not believers, and even some who are, see, see the Ten Commandments as something that God gave us to punish us, rather than commandments which God gave to bless us. We're assured if we will follow these, this moral code of the Ten Commandments, our lives will be better. We'll be happier. Our children, our spouses, our family as a whole, our church will be happier. So help us to come to grips, if we haven't already, with this truth that God must be first. Let that ring in our ears until we understand it and accept it and act on it. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. You are dismissed.